So good evening, everyone. My name is Abba Kwao. I am the founder and president of TAAPR. Uh, thank you again for joining us this week. We're in store. We have a, a really great chat tonight in store, a little housekeeping. Um, please use your uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions, because we certainly will take some questions at the end of, of this chat tonight. And please do engage with us on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm at TAA underscore uh, PR. And you can also find Marcellus, the wonderful author who will be talking to you tonight on Instagram, on Twitter, as well on Supreme Models book on on Twitter and uh, on Instagram as well. So um, without further ado, I'd love to get Marcellus in here and we'll get uh, the night started. I hope you guys are doing well and sipping on something good. Hey, there you are. How are you, Marcellus? <laughs> uh oh, turn on your um, turn on your mic so I can hear you. <laughs> Hello? I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. How are you? I am wonderful, I must say. I was so intimidated to get on this with you because your skin, first of all, and the subject of our conversation tonight is all about beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, Black women. So thank you, thank you so much for coming on tonight uh, for our chat. Well, I reached out to you. I saw the Andre Leon Towie um, thing, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> Andre Leon Towie, I want to do it. And you, <laughs> you were like, like, right away, you were like, absolutely. Yes, because I know of this book, and I've had several friends say, have you read this book? Do you have this book? Um, so immediately, you know, look at God, right? And here we are, here we are today for a wonderful conversation with several of our friends um, across the country, actually. So I'm really excited for that. Um, so for those of you who were on with us before um, we saw or got to see Marcellus's beautiful face, you got to see images um, from his book. And I'm just changing my view so I can see you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> ah! Oh my gosh. <laughs> Marcellus. I mean, words cannot actually do this book justice. I got to tell you guys, I got to, he sent me a special book. He sent me a delivery. And when I received it and I unboxed it, I just had to take a breath. <gasps> this book is just beautiful in and out, just like you. Uh, so before we get started, good people, let me tell you a little something about Marcellus. Marcellus is a model himself. He is, yes, <laughs> you, you still are. I'm claiming that for you. <laughs> um, he's a celebrity uh, stylist and a journalist, and now he can add author, uh, you know, to his credits as uh, his first book and his dream has come to life. Um, before we start our conversation, I really love the quote on the back of the book from the queen herself, Naomi Campbell. <laughs> Naomi says, Supreme Models defines the importance of the Black model, not just to fashion and culture, but also as an agent of change for how all people of color are seen globally. This book is an incredible collection of women, a group I'm honored to be a part of, who have had the fashion industry, who have made the fashion industry more diverse, more inclusive, and, and a more inclusive place. They broke barriers, opened up doors, raised their voices, and showed up the power of visibility. Thank you, Miss Naomi. Uh, what a powerful, powerful statement that you have there on the back of this gorgeous, gorgeous book. Yes. You know, so I wanted to get started and chat and find out a little bit more about you. Mr. Marcellus, I want to hear about you. Now, I read this and I know a little bit about you, but share with us what it was like growing up in the shy in Chicago. Shy. So I'm a little black boy from the south side of Chicago. I will always be that. You know, that's my, that's, that's at my core who I am. Yeah. Um, I grew up on the south side. Um, Born and raised, and you know, it was um, kind of tough. Like, um, single mother, there were three of us. I have, two, I have two younger brothers. I was the oldest. And there were times when we were, like, poor, and then there were times when my mother had a good job or 
or a good boyfriend and we had money. And, you know, it's never easy in, unfortunately, in black culture for the gay kid, you know? So I was that gay kid that was smart, um, inquisitive, and I was bullied and I was beaten up and I was um, treated unkindly. So I spent a lot of time with my grandmother who lived in the same building that I did. She was the matriarch of our family. And she sort of, um, I could have gone a different way if it wasn't for my grandmother because she always counteracted the negative that I was getting from other people with this positive. Okay. So it was always like, you are a prince, you are wonderful. My grandmother used to do something because my cousin lived upstairs from, my cousin lived upstairs with my grandmother. Mm -hmm. And every day before we would get dressed to go to school, as we were getting dressed to go to school, she would put our coats on or she would look at us before we walked out the door. And she would give each one of us these little things for us to take through the door, you know, and into the world. So she would say to me, the word of the day is magnificent. Go be magnificent. Oh. I love that. Um, my brother was like, you know, all over the place. So she would be, today I want you to work on paying attention because I don't want you to miss anything today. Wow. You know, she would give each of us what we needed every single day to go out to the, into the world and have a message and have a meaning. And I grew up in her house where there was books, mm -hmm. you know, and those were my friends. And there was the encyclopedia. So if I saw something I didn't understand, I would go look it up in the encyclopedia. You know, I remember watching Mahogany. And when she went to Rome, I was like, <laughs> and I got the, the encyclopedia out. And I looked up Rome, and Rome was in Italy. And then I was like, and people that are, people in Italy speak Italian. And, and Italian is one of the Romance languages, along with French and blah, blah, blah. And so she gave me this space to dream. Yeah. There was ebony and essence in our house. You know what I mean? Yeah. And there was Jet Magazine. Yeah. And, there was, and she was always like, today we're going to the museum. You know? Oh. She tried to get me outside of the bubble that was like the South Side, maybe. That if I got caught in and began to believe the negative stuff, I would have maybe stayed in. Mm. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful person to have in your life and as a young man to help shape you know, your future. So thank you, Grandma. Thank you, Mom. So tell us a little bit, who were your early style icons at this, uh, you know, this young age? Oh, my God. So I was obsessed. Okay, so there's two things that I was obsessed with. First of all, I was obsessed with Ebony okay. because that, you know, Ebony magazine was like the Black Life magazine. Yes. So it was like, <laughs> all things cool all things important to people of color were in Ebony magazine, right? Yeah. So I would read that Ebony from cover to cover, girl. There was, a, there was an Ebony magazine in the 70s, and Iman was on the cover. And I was always obsessed with Iman. I don't know why, but Iman was just the height of, like, beautiful and chic to me. Mm -hmm. And Iman was on the cover of Ebony with her first husband, Spencer Haywood, the basketball player. Mm -hmm. And they were, on, and she was on the cover with her first daughter, mm -hmm. and they were a nuclear family. And it was like one of the one of one of the first times I really realized that I didn't have a father, mm -hmm. you know, because he was on the cover and he looked really handsome and he was smiling and Iman looked all elegant and beautiful and the daughter was smiling and I remember thinking, I want a dad. I want to know who my dad is. Mm -hmm. Image sort of stuck with me my entire life. And then there was this image of Sammy Davis Jr. of all people. And Sammy Davis Jr. was on the cover of Ebony. And he was standing in front of his house in LA. And I mean, it's this huge mansion. And he's standing in front of this giant car. You know, in my mind, it was a Bentley, but it was probably some big ass Lincoln. <laughs> and back then, that was everything, too. So. <laughs> and he was wearing a blazer. Yeah on like this brown plaid blazer and he had like dark brown trousers and he just looked like a boss. And I remember thinking one day I want to look like that. I want to look that in control of my destiny. I'm going to look like that important. You know what I mean? It's Don't so important to have those 
vivid images, you know, as a young person um, growing up. So that's so interesting that you discovered that in your grandmother's house, you know, with all of the books and the magazines that you grew up surrounded with. So tell me about your first steps uh, towards this world of fashion that you would later dominate. Oh, God. So I was 15 years old. I was in high school. Yeah. And I was out shopping one day, and I bumped into the friend, the older sister of a friend I went to grammar school with. And she was like, look at you all grown. Like, how old are you? And I was like, 15, you know, what grade are you in? Blah, blah, blah. And she was like, are you looking for a job? And I was like, no. Like, you know, it hadn't even crossed my mind that I should get a job. And she was like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm assistant manager of a clothing store and we're looking for a stock boy. You're so cute. You should come down and, and, and see. So I went my butt down to Water Tower in Chicago and the store was called T. Edwards, which was the store back in the day. And the moment I walked through the door, I wanted to work there because it was all like um, Gene Ewing Biss and Norma Kamali and Willie Smith, you know, and like black all leather jackets and all the girls that worked there looked like models because they were all dressed up, you know, and it was multicultural. There was like this beautiful black woman named Tara. And I ended up, ha they interviewed me on the spot and the manager was this um, very short, tiny Jewish woman named Heidi Sherwin. Mm -hmm. And Heidi was like, sure, come on, come work a couple of days after week, you know, after school, what time can you get here? And I went there and I started, I was a stock boy. So I would be vacuuming. I would be changing light bulbs. I would be cleaning fixtures. I would be helping them flip the floor. But because it was a woman's clothing store, the women in the store would all come to me and ask my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, wanted a male opinion. I'm this like 15 year old, like kid from the South side with no real sense of style. And I would give them my opinion. and. And my boss, Heidi, saw that. And she was like, I'm going to make you a salesperson. Can you do that? And I was like, yes. yes. <laughs> when I wasn't even supposed to be legally working, I think the legal age to work is 16. I lied about my age. And I became a salesperson. And within a year, I was like the number two salesperson in the company. Wow. It was so crazy. I was a sophomore in high school. And I would go... I would leave high school, I would go to work, and I would be selling like two, three, four thousand dollars in a day, and I was making commission plus my hourly. And so at first, you know, my first few checks were like, you know, a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, because they were like um, you know, bus boy, like stock boy checks. Oh, yeah. Suddenly my checks are like two thousand dollars. It was like crazy. Because it was what did you do with your first two thousand dollars? <laughs> Mother, I had no idea what the concept of money was. So I would give my checks to my mother and my mother would still give me allowance. Oh. She would, this is your money for lunch. This is your money for your bus pass. This is your money to get around. And, just, and meanwhile, she's like shopping at Neiman Marcus. <laughs> exactly. I'll let my kids hear that because I'm going to spend their money too. <laughs> That is amazing. So you clearly, Marcellus, you clearly were a natural. And you write in your book about how for the first time you actually felt a sense of freedom and you, se you felt seen while doing um, the work in the retail space. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I come, Chicago is very racially polarized. It's like the South Side is Black. The Southwest side is Polish. There's, there's Chinatown, blah, blah, blah. And so you could live and die on the South side of Chicago and never really interact with white people. You know what I mean? Well, you have to, like maybe your teachers, maybe the, the, um, the priests at your church, you know, maybe like the police, of course, or somebody that owns a store. But that's what it kind of was. So it wasn't until I left the South side and started working in retail with these women that were very cosmopolitan and they had no problem with the little black gay kid. In mm -hmm. fact, the fact that I was gay was actually kind of this cool thing mm -hmm. where they were like, so what? They were like, oh my God, you're so cute. Do you have a boyfriend yet? And I didn't even know, like, I didn't know anything about that. I was still in the closet. You know what I mean? I was still like trying to pretend like 
I liked girls. Mm -hmm. And they were super accepting of that. But more than that, they cared about how I felt, what I thought, my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody was like, if they were selling something and somebody couldn't close, they would call me over. And I'd be like, girl, that outfit is amazing. You should be in pink. Have you tried on the red? You know, and it gave me this sense of self that I could actually do something and my opinion mattered. And I had, and I had, um, I had meaning and purpose. Yeah. I really, it, I was more than the fag. You know what I mean? Not to say that word, but I grew up being called a fag, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and being told everywhere I turned that I was bad or I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so this was like the first time that people were like accepted me for who I was mm -hmm. and accepted me, accepted my journey as I figured out who I was. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's and really interesting. Powerful. So there, were, there you were being your fabulous self and, and growing up and coming into your own when somebody spotted you and suggested that you model. Tell us about how you made that transition. That was years later. Um, what's funny is that when I was in high school, I did get, this is so funny and I haven't thought about this. Wait, Tamiko just texted me. Yes, I see her. <laughs> she's uh, she's off. Yes. Okay. <laughs> funny because while I was playing like salesperson at this clothing store, there were all these models that worked in the store and they would come into the store. And one of the girls was named Dawn, no, Sandy. Mm -hmm. And Sandy was like, you should model. I want to introduce you to my, I want to introduce you to my agent. Her name is Mary Bonesher. And I was like, girl, I'm in school. I got a job. I don't have time for this. You know, like I wasn't even thinking in those terms. So it was like, she was the first person that actually said that, you know what I mean? But what was crazy was years later after I was like, after I was stopped working in retail and I was working my way through college, I ended up waiting tables in a restaurant in Chicago and it was one of the hot restaurants, right? So I'm standing there working a lunch shift, which I didn't want to work because I was only working nights, you know what I mean? And I was a diva, but you had to work one lunch shift a week in order to get nights. So I'm working my penance lunch shift. And I to this table and it's three women and I'm like oh god it's three women they're not gonna tip they're gonna want everything on the side blah 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 you know but this is how waiters think this is real <laughs> so I walk up to the table and as soon as I walk up I'm like hi I'm Marcellus the specials today are blah 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 I'm giving you my spiel and um because I was like a slinker I would slink around the restaurant everybody <laughs> was a dancer and so one of the women looks up at me and she's like, wow, you're really good looking. You should be a model. And I was like, girl, have the salmon. It's lovely. <laughs> and then the other woman at the table was like, do you think she started laughing? She was like, do you think she's done this before? And all three of the women started laughing. And then the third woman is like, just so that you know, that's Mary Bonesher. This is Marie Anderson. If they say you should be a model, you should be a model. So the woman at the table was the woman that owned the agency from a million years before that my friend wanted to introduce me to. Okay. So it came full circle in this really weird way because she, my friend was right. She was like, Mary Bonshire would love you. Yeah. And so I ended up, Marie Anderson was the woman, was her partner who discovered Cindy Crawford and all these other like 90s models. And Marie was like, here's my card, give us a call, come into the agency. And that was it. Like literally I went in and first they told me no. The booker told me no. And I was like, wow. And I didn't care because I didn't really want to do it. Like it wasn't something I was pursuing. Yeah. And, but at the same time, all these people around me were like, you should model. So I had already shot for Mademoiselle with the photographer that saw me in the restaurant. Oh wow. So I had the film from the Mademoiselle, Mademoiselle shoot and then I shot with Victor Skripneski, who's a big Chicago photographer, for like Chicago Social. And so when that ran, the, the booker from the agency called and he was like, okay, clearly you should be a model like you, so come back in. And that's how it started. So that's so how it started. you found yourself suddenly a model and you got to travel the world. 
you got to see all of those places that you had seen in the Ebony and the Jet Magazine and in Elle and all those books in your grandmother's house. Yeah. Now you were experiencing them firsthand. What was your life as an international model like? Um, my first couple of seasons as a model, like I started working right out the gate. It was so crazy. Like literally my car came out and I got my first booking within a week. Oh. And then my second week I had like, like there was a day where I had like a $2,500 day and a half day for the same client later in the week. And I remember walking into the agency and the receptionist guy was like, hey, supermodel with your $3,500 week. And I was like, yes. Um, but I was like a junior. I mean, I was like in my 20s and I was doing juniors. So I was like jumping because I was like, I wasn't really a model. So I was trying to be an actor. So I was like not approaching it like, oh, I, you know, I have to be like, you know, giving you face. I was mm -hmm. like, run, jump, spin, you know. And so clients loved that because I wasn't trying to be cool. I was trying to give you what you want. You know what I mean? So I would walk in, I'd be like, okay, what are we shooting today? He's back to school. Okay, what are you, you know, what, what's your, what are your clients like? And I would be like, you know, jumping for calls and, and skipping for like Target. And like, you know, I was like known for smiling and known for like jumping and moving. I was like a mover. Yeah. So I really did really well right out of the gate as a catalog boy. And so I was in Chicago, I was in Dallas um, doing JCPenney. I was in New York, you know, shooting Parisians, Dillard's, like every major department store and every not so major department store across the country I had worked for. And then, um, and I'd gone to Miami a couple times for a season and loved being in Miami. I didn't work a lot in Miami, but I loved being down there with my friends, especially being away from Chicago in the winter. Yeah. And I ended up in Chicago getting scouted by Norman Jean Roy, who's this big photographer of all people. And Norman Jean Roy wanted to shoot me for a book. And he was like, will you shoot, will you shave your head? And I was like, Yes, because I knew who Norman Jean Roy was. But my bookers were like, no, he makes too much money. So I was pulling down six figures as a, as a, as like a team model. Yeah. And they were like, no, he makes too much money. And I was like, no, I'm shaving my head. And I shaved my head at this salon in Chicago. They shaved it for me for the first time. And I sat in the chair like a girl getting her first haircut. And I cried like a baby. <laughs> Norman took those photos and it was me with the shaved head. And it was right around the time when Tyson was about, was just coming out and um, the Cannon brothers and Richard Elms and all these boys with like super short hair that really sort of looked black. Yeah. And it just took me to the next level. And an uh, agency in London wanted me to come over, Goodfellas. And I got my butt on the plane and went and stayed in Europe for like a year and a half. And it was a blast. It was crazy. Wow. You know, there's something, once you get out of the United States, you actually see how small the United States is in this weird way. You know what I mean? And it changes your perspective because you realize that it's not America first. Every country thinks that they're the best. Every country thinks they're first. And then you get out of the country and you meet people from, like, I lived in, a, in Milan in the, uh, in, the, in the Pola, which was this model hotel. And when I got there, there were three of us in the hotel room. Oh. I stayed until show season. And by the time show season hit, there were like eight of us. We literally had to walk on each other's cots to get to the bathroom. Oh. <laughs> Luckily, the bathroom was en suite. It was in the room. And it was, there were two Spanish boys that didn't speak English or Italian. So we were all trying to translate with them. There was this little Southern kid that was like 16 and was modeling. And so we were all taking care of him. And then he was gay. So he was like, disappear and go hook up with guys. And so I'll be like, he's going to get killed. You know what I mean? It was just this amazing, like, it was this lesson in like chic and, 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 and being on your own and not speaking the language and navigating the streets and, 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 and I mean, I just grew up so, so much then, you know, and met so many incredible people while I was away that are still in my life to this day. 
Oh, that is wonderful. And we do have some here today, but we'll get to that. I have a question for you because this book is really groundbreaking. <laughs> Gorgeous, first of its kind. And what inspired you to take the journey to become an author and specifically to put this book out into the world? So, I mean, I think this is the, this is, this book is the culmination of my entire life. You know what I mean? This is the book that little 10 year old Marcellus would have loved if his grandmother had it. Mm -hmm. And he would have read it for cover to cover and he would have cherished every image. You know what I mean? And he would have cross reference, you know, numero magazine and he would have looked for Vogue Poland. You know, and because it's so beautiful and every image inside is like so stunning. And so there's that because we need to see ourselves represented beautifully, right? And then having been a model, even though I was successful, it was still sort of racist, you know? I would be on the set and there would be like 20 models on the set and there would only be like me, the black guy, and one black girl, you know? And then maybe a Latin girl that kind of looked like she was white. You know what I mean? And then I remember going to agencies when I started trying to get agencies outside of Chicago. And I remember going into agencies and being told, oh, we, we already have a black model. We already have a black boy. But then you look at the board and they have like 200 models. They have every iteration of white model possible, but you have a small corner down at the bottom that has like five black models. And they're supposed to represent all of us, you know? Or Tamiko tells this wonderful story, who we're going to see later, about being in Paris and being told that they weren't seeing Black girls after she stood in line for three hours at a casting. Yes. You know, when I was in Milan, my roommates would have like eight castings a day. And I would have like maybe three a week. Now, my three castings a week were amazing castings because they were a request casting for Giorgio Armani or Olivier Toscano for Benetton. You know, it was like real, it was like major clients that only wanted to see me because I was black and I was in town. Yeah. You know what I mean? And were looking to use me for real jobs, you know, for good jobs. You know, I shot for Womo Vogue while I was there with Tim Morrison. So I got good castings, but I wasn't getting the same amount of castings that my white and or white identifying um, roommates were getting, yeah. you know, and that's fashion, you know? So this book was really like, we're black, we occupy a space, we take up that space fully, and still we, even though you don't want us to, to thrive, even though you don't want us to, to be successful, we kill it, you know? There's nothing like a black model on the runway. There's nothing like Naomi Campbell on the runway or Tyra or Roshumba or Veronica Webb, you know? We slay the runway. We bring life to every photo we're in as far as print. Yes. You know, there's nothing like a black model as far as our personality. And if you shoot us right, the, we're the most, if you're a photographer who knows how to light us, if you give us a team that knows how to do our hair and makeup, we kill that. You know what I mean? It's just natural. It's right. just, and so I wanted to do a book that celebrated that because even though the cards are stacked against us, we still somehow dominate. We still somehow thrive. We still somehow leave our mark. Yeah. And for us, it's you know, so much more. It is, it is a beautiful book. And I loved, as much as it, it is a beautiful book with all of the gorgeous photography, I loved the stories. Um, and, 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 the, and the interviews um, that you did. And actually, I learned, I learned a lot. You know, there were things in this book that were, were intriguing and interesting to me. So I'm gonna jump to the beginning um, so that we can jump ahead because I really could sit and talk to you for the next 10 hours. <laughs> um, I'm curious to know about the beginning. One of the things that was so interesting to me, I did not know about the women you call the trailblazers at the beginning of this book. It was so intriguing to me to read about Miss Ophelia, you know, passing for white and therefore being able to go through the Vogue School of Fashion Modeling um, and then going on to discover some of the most important uh, fashion models of the 50s. You know, I, I thought that was really, really 
interesting um, and something I've really learned in that book. And I've given that book to my 12 year old daughter so that she can also be, be educated and see herself. Um, so tell us a little bit, you know, about those kind of 1950s, you know, uh, pioneers that you call, you know, the trailblazers. Well, the story of black modeling nest actually starts with the, um, with the creation of Ebony Magazine in 1945. That's where it starts. Because before that, there really wasn't a need to see black models elegantly, right? Um, we were usually maids, or we, it was much like it was in the movies. We were the mammy, we were the maid. These yeah. white publications weren't catering to black people, so they didn't have to show us the way that we really lived and the way that we really were. They were only worried about showing the stereotype of us, you know, showing us negatively, not glamorously. So it was when Ebony started and John H. Johnson was like, I'm going to do the Black Life magazine. And so there needs to be celebrities and sports figures, but there needs to be fashion. And so it created a need for Black models. And then there were all these other, because of the success of Ebony, there were all these other Black magazines like Sepia and Hue. You know, all of them had to do with color. And so there was a, there was a, a market finally for Black models. But here's the thing, and here's how insidious racism is. Colorism came into play. So they still wanted Black models that were quote unquote light skin in these Black publications. So you had Dorothea Towles, you had Ophelia DeVore, you had Sarah Lou Harris. You had these beautiful Black women, but they were fair skinned and they had like, you know, quote unquote good hair, you know, and they had their hair done like white women. They followed their white counterparts. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until like later on in the 50s when Helen Williams, who was a dark Black woman, sort of broke through. And that was because she was a fashion stylist and she was working for photographers. And all the photographers would be like, girl, why are you a stylist? You should be a model. And Helen was like, really? Like, she was like, you think so? And they were like, yeah. And one of the photographers she shot, one of the photographers she worked for, shot her for, shot her, and it ended up running in like a, like the New York, like a New York magazine, like a supplement for a newspaper. And she couldn't get an agency, but by then Ophelia DeVore had started her own agency. And so she took, she took Helen on. And before Ophelia DeVore, Dorothea Towles had gone to Paris and she had conquered Paris. So Ophelia was like, go to Paris, see what happens there. And again, D D Dorothea Towles goes to Paris, works for Christian Dior, works for Chaparelli, works for all these high-end couturiers, so she opens the door. Helen Williams, a dark-skinned woman, goes and works for even more clients, and now the door is open in Paris. You know what I mean? Wonderful. And I love that you included all of this in your book, because honestly, I found it very, very intriguing and educational. Thank you for that. I want you to, the book is a photography book. It's an art book. So yes, the pictures are arresting. You can open it to any page, and there's going to be a beautiful photo. But along the way, I think you have to understand the history. You know, it's like the Naomi quote. Yes. Every time a Black model breaks through, there's a cultural shift. We're actually right there when things change. Mm -hmm. So when you know when you think about the 40s and the mid 40s and the 50s, that's when like we're at we're out of World War II, mm -hmm. and so all these black soldiers are coming back home, you know. And so black women have been working while the soldiers are away. So now you've got like two income families, and you've got black people that have disposable income, and they go to movies, and they go to dinner, and they go to theaters, and they dress up, they go to the Cotton Club, you know. And they want to be seen the way that we want to, we want to be seen the way that we are. And so that was like part of a cultural shift. Then you get into the, the 60s and you get into like people, the late 50s, early 60s, where people are like becoming like more and more like black proud, you know? And we needed to see images that represented our real lives, not stereotypical images, but real images that represented us at our greatest, yeah. at our highest. Beautiful. And that's I love that. So we move on into a section of the book 
and we have to talk about the person you call the godmother. And you know, Beth Ann Hardison um, is the queen. <laughs> and Diane von Furstenberg calls uh, Beth Ann the godmother of all the wonderful and beautiful models all the wonderful and beautiful women. Naomi Campbell even refers to her as mom. Beth Ann is a pioneer uh, in the modern uh, uh, um, fashion world, if you will, and she sends you her love. She is still up there in upstate, uh, self-quarantined, shutting everything off, as she said, to tell you she adores you. Um, I, I want to talk about Beth Ann because she's somebody um, who has been pivotal for, for decades, and she's still very active in advocating uh, for diversity in the fashion world, and, and she's still at it now in her 70s. Tell me about your relationship with Beth Ann. I mean, okay, so I interviewed Beth Ann, and like, I don't know how I got to Beth Ann. That's what's so amazing. But I, well, I, when I started doing interviews for the book, I started just interviewing the girls that I knew and that I had worked with. Yeah. And so someone put me in touch with Beth Ann and Beth Ann actually, I think Shakara Ladard put me in touch with Beth Ann and Beth Ann actually answered my email and she was like, boy, here's my number, call me. <laughs> Called her and we sat on the phone and talked for like two hours. And you don't interview Beth Ann, you just let Beth Ann talk. She tells <laughs> you what you want to know. Yes. And I was so intimidated, right? I was so like, just like intimidated because it was Beth Ann. But listening to her story, you understand that she, the history is there. She was there at all the pivotal points. Yeah. And she was sort of like the agent of change that pushed things, that moved things along behind the curtain. Right. You know, she, still she, does. Was this, she was this person that like white fashion embraced. She could push things along subtly without making them feel threatened. So it wasn't militant when she would point out, why are there no black models in brides magazines? We get married too. Mm -hmm. Or why are you paying, when somebody would call, cause she had her own agency and she was one of the first bookers at Click Models, which was a major. When someone would call and they would be booking like a white model and a black model and they would want to pay less for the black model, they would be like, well, why are you paying this model that amount and this model that amount? If they're doing the same job on the same set, shouldn't they be making the same amount, you know? And so you need that person that knows how to talk to people, that's willing to plant those seeds in the right way. And, and she's well respected, to your point, in the community. So when she says it, people receive it differently. But before we get to her role as uh, an agent, you know, she really was one of the very first prolific models. And I have someone here with us today, Robin Gibbon, who is the only Pulitzer Prize winning uh, fashion critic. She is at the Washington Post now, but Robin is also an author. And in March of 2015, hi Robin, she published the book, The Battle of Versailles. Robin, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hello, congratulations on your beautiful book. Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. <laughs> so because I love Robin and anywhere I can take her, I'll beg her to come along. But this one is here because she is the expert, of, amongst many things, on the Battle of Versailles, because your 2015 book really dives into that 1974 event that really changed how American fashion was viewed. And I think it was 10 or 11 of the models that went into that event were African-American models. So Robin, first of all, I have to ask this question, you know, what inspired you to write a book about the Battle of Versailles? Well, um, uh, and it was 1973, definitely. <laughs> Make sure that's clear. Um, you know, it's, it was one of those things in which uh, the book kind of shows me, or I should say that uh, the literary agent who had seen a story about um, a celebration of those, of the, of the Versailles show that uh, the Metropolitan Museum uh, had organized. It was a luncheon celebrating the designers, the American designers, the models, everyone who had been there. And um, there was a lovely uh, story about it in the, in the newspaper and this agent had seen it and called me out of the blue and said, I have this thought and I wanted to talk to you about it. Do you want, will you have a coffee? 
And I said, sure, why not? Um, always have coffee. And uh, he sort of pitched this idea of a book about the show. And I responded by saying, you know, I really wasn't interested in writing, uh, you know, a book that was just sort of about a fashion show that I was, that what's interesting to me was the cultural context in which it took place, the story behind the models, why it happened, and, you know, how it eventually had this enormous impact on the fashion industry in hindsight. Yeah. And he sort of went, that's a great idea. And that's how I sort of went down that path. Wow. So in 1973, my understanding is the top uh, American designers went to Paris, to Versailles, and it was part of a fundraiser, correct? Uh, to, to rehab the, the palace. And it was America versus the Parisian designers. Tell us about what went down that day. Yeah, it was uh, originally uh, created to be a fundraiser to help restore parts of uh, the Palace of Versailles. And it was the brainchild of a publicist, Eleanor Lambert, who really believed that uh, American designers should be given the same kind of respect um, and um, attention as American artists. So she uh, had this idea that a great way to put these American designers on the world stage was to organize a charity fashion show. And it would be even more impressive if these American designers were quote unquote invited by their French counterparts. And so, um, the, the five designers who, American designers who actually ended up going, one could argue whether or not they were the top American designers at that time, uh, because like anything that happens in the fashion industry, it was fraught with politics and ego. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the five designers were Oscar de la Renta and Bill Blass. Um, who am I forgetting? Stephen Burroughs, Anne Klein, and Halston. Yes. And, you know, they were each chosen for particular reasons. Um, at the end of the day, they were all um, in some way clients or friends of Eleanor Lambert. That was the through line. Um, but the most interesting choice uh, in, in my mind was Stephen Burroughs because he was significantly younger um, than many of the other designers. And he also, you know, was designing from a very different place. You know, he was, in hindsight, incredibly influential because he was really bringing the sense of style from um, nightclubs and Fire Island and, you know, his own neighborhood and, and the street into this world of, fashion showrooms and you know that was really unique and really opened the door for so many other designers to walk through interesting but i hear was it 10 or 11 of the models were actually african-american uh if memory serves because it's been a while since i read my own book and it's a uh, jealous book as well <laughs> it was a dozen it was about a dozen okay about a dozen of these uh uh models that that uh, presented the collection were African-American. Something that you said in, in the book is that by the end of the evening, the Americans had, official, had officially taken their place on the world stage, uh, prompting a major shift in the way race, gender, sexuality, and economics would be treated in fashion for decades to come. And I thought that was pretty profound. You know, what happened after, because you said in hindsight is when we look at the Battle of Versailles and what it meant for the industry. What was that impact? Yeah, I mean, at the time, um, you know, the designers going into it and the models themselves really weren't looking at it as this historical event. Um, you know, the designers were looking at it as a great PR you know, uh, uh, possibility. And a lot, most of the models were looking at it as, you know, a fun trip to Paris to be in this great show at Versailles. And, you know, several of them had said they hadn't really been to Paris or had been, you know, they, 
they, they just really wanted to go. So it was really looked at as just sort of being in the moment. But afterwards, uh, you know, for the designers, you know, I think it was a really significant sort of psychic shift. You know, before that, so much of the American fashion industry had really been about copying what was happening in Paris. And not in a sneaky, backhanded sort of way. I mean, it was sort of regulated copying. I mean, it was sort of what happened. Um, but this was a moment when, you know, designers, their names were starting to actually appear on the labels of clothing that they were designing, not the store's label, mm -hmm. the store's name. And it really gave them a sense that the sportswear that they were designing, uh, this very wearable, um, pragmatic in many respects, um, clothing that really connected with the way that women's lives were changing, that it could stand up against the clothing in Paris that was really, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the children of couture. So, so that was huge. And I think that a lot of the designers today, the American designers who go to Paris and show their collections, you know, they really owe a debt to those designers from Versailles who kind of said, you can do it. And you can not only do it, you can be incredibly successful doing it. Um, for the models, um, after that, you know, one of the most significant things, significant things was uh, Givenchy, who was one of the French designers, was so impressed with the way that the American models, particularly the black models, dominated the stage that he was really inspired to create you know, a cabine that was almost all black models. And he was met with pushback. You know, he had clients that were not comfortable with that and didn't want to wear clothes. It had been modeled by black models. Um, but it absolutely changed, at least for a good period of time, the way that people thought about what it meant to be a model. Um, you know, they were expected to, to move with uh, individuality and with confidence, they were expected to show the clothes, not just walk in the clothes. And, you know, they, people were looking for models who, you know, who stood out. And, you know, this preceded a time, you know, in the 90s when fashion took a turn and designers were more uh, interested in creating a homogenous look on the runway. You're right about that. And so Marcellus, you cover a lot of this in your, your book uh, and, and even in some of the interviews, especially with, with your piece on, on, um, on Bethann. And I asked, I asked Robin to be here today because she's really um, done the research on the Battle of Versailles. But I'm interested to pivot into, you know, that was a time in the early 70s. Bethann talks about getting work all over the place and they were very much in demand for many, many years after that. Where are we today? And Robin, I know you've written stories about diversity on the runways, you know, for the last several years, but even now as we enter, you know, this era of, of, of BLM and Black Lives Matter and, and everyone is looking to, to show uh, more Black you know, lives, quite frankly, on the runway and in fashion. I'm just curious to get both of your opinions on, you know, where do you think we are now? in terms of diversity and, and, and black models um, uh, in fashion? Shall I go first, Robin, or is it ladies first? Oh, no, you're the man of the hour. You should go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we are, okay, so it's always been my assertion that fashion sort of is the precursor to like major social change. So right now we're seeing like people in the streets protesting, we're seeing Black Lives Matter. There's, it's like this moment of like black, like black pride also, you know? But all my friends that work in entertainment and work in fashion, we've been saying that, especially in entertainment, we've been saying that there's this new black renaissance happening. And it's been happening for a couple of years. So you had shows like Scandal and How to Get Away with Murder were like the number one shows on television. Then you had Issa Rae doing... Um, then you had Donald Glover doing his show, Atlanta. So you have all these shows that are not just like shows that are a new perspective because they're from a very black place with primarily black cast, 
you have these shows that are showing different individual slices of black experience, right? So that's actually sort of happened when we start talking about fashion, because now you have plus models that want to take their place right besides normal models per se, right? So now that's actually, think about it. Victoria's Secret used to be the highest thing a model could get. Now, Victoria's Secret is basically done because now there's been this pushback in the, in the consciousness and globally outside of fashion that we no longer want to see just the skinny white model in underwear. We want to see real women. We want to see women with curves. And that also was, uh, there was like this sort of switch too in modeling where it was like, we wanted to see black women with their natural hair. And that started with black models going, you know what, I'm not going to get a weave. My hair is enough. My natural texture is enough. My curls are enough. And that started with social media with people like Ebony Davis speaking out about it. You know, so that all sort of happened just before this moment now where we're like Black Lives Matter pro protesting in the street. It's always fashion is always like right there before like that big shift happens. And it's also pushing us forward. So I think that we're seeing this new renaissance in fashion where a lot of black girls that probably couldn't get an agency before are now getting agencies and are now top models, like a Nuck Yai, like a Dutt, you know? These were girls that were like dark and didn't have like a, a weave and didn't look sort of European. And now they're like not the, not the exception like an Alec Weck, they're becoming the norm. Yeah. So I think fashion is actually moving forward as we as a people move forward also. Mm -hmm. Robin, do you mind? I, and I, I do want to get your thoughts on this. So we do have one of the the the, fat, the, the supreme models uh, who has been with us from the beginning. If I, I do want to bring her into this part of the conversation, Tamiko, are you there? If you could turn your camera on, I'd love to get you in here um, as we talk about something that you you have have lived. <laughs> Guys, if you can turn Tamiko's um, video on, I'd love to chat with her. There she is. Hello, beautiful. <laughs> Miko Frazier. Hey, here hi. I am. Hi. Hi. Models who was featured in Marcellus's book. And uh, she is one of your favorites. Tamiko, you've been at it since 1993, and you're still as gorgeous. I can't even believe it. Um, yes. <laughs> she's in here, but I wanted to be in here. I got one to Marcellus. <laughs> I've got mine too, not to be left yes. out, but we'll get you one. Um, I wanted to bring you in at this point in the conversation because I think you have walked this walk and we were just talking about what it was like for you. You know, we talked about Beth Ann in the 70s and all that she has done, but even for you starting in the early 90s and still being active until this day, you know, what are we seeing on the runways and in fashion for black models and black people. And I think Robin was about to, to get into her response. We heard what, what um, Marcellus had to say, but I just wanted to get you in here so we can talk about it. But Robin, please. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Marcellus was saying. I think that, uh, you know, fashion, it, when it, we look at the range of models today is in a tremendously better place than it was, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, when I look at uh, runway shows and editorials, you know, it's um, it's a glaring um, uh, it, it's a, it's a glaring misstep when a brand doesn't have a diverse range of models. I mean, it really stands out. And you know, I think a huge debt goes to you know the work that Beth Ann did and and that Iman and, and Naomi have done in speaking up about that and pushing that. Um, but I also think that, you know, in many respects, the models are kind of the tip of the fashion iceberg, so to speak. You know, they are what the average person sees as representative of the industry. And I've always said that they're part of their importance is that, you know, when we look at models, that is sort of, that is how we define beauty. And we are a culture that places tremendous value on beauty. And to be included in the definition of beauty is to be included in the def definition of who is valued. And I think that's a really significant piece of why diversity and inclusiveness in the world of models really matters. But you know, below that, 
you know, when you start looking at who's, who's photographing the models, who's creative directing the fashion shoots, who's designing the clothes, who has the power to buy those clothes, who has the power to run those retail operations. I mean, that's when, that's where I think the industry has an enormous amount of catching up to do because oh, wow. those decisions are not made by uh, a cast that is inclusive. Very, very, very important point. Um, Tamiko, you um, have been at this for quite a while and I'm interested to hear, and Robin, thank you um, for that, but I'm interested to hear from you, Tamika, on how uh, it was for you starting in 1993 or before getting discovered and getting representation and then going on to get work. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you so much to both you and Marcellus for inviting me to be a part of this very important conversation today. I am honored to be here today to speak on behalf of beautiful Black models. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yes, you are correct. I have been at this for a very long time. Um, I was actually already considered older when I started modeling because I started modeling at the age of 25. And I have been modeling for 27 years, so I'll let you all do the math. Um, I have taken breaks here and there, but for the most part, I have had the good fortune of maintaining my career for 27 years. And at 52, I'm just getting started all over again. But um, in the beginning, yes, it was very tough being a brown skin model. I had a weave back then. Um, you know, I have encountered uh, discrimination. I have had to fight for myself and advocate for myself to get jobs, to be seen by clients. Um, the list can go on and on and on. And I feel like, you know, the girls that are coming up today, thankfully, we are seeing more uh, beautiful shades of brown skin, textures of, of natural hair. Um, it is not um, as odd to see a more, a more than one of us on a set. Um, it was, it, I remember show season back in the 90s being like the Black Girl Reunion because we would never see each other on shoots because there would only be one of us there. But when we would go to Paris or to Milan or to London to do the shows, we would all be in the corner catching up with each other while we're getting our hair and makeup done because we would never get to see each other at work. So um, like Marcella said, to, said a, a little bit ago, thankfully the industry is expanding and we are seeing uh, women that are different sizes, that are older, thank you, more seasoned like myself uh, being represented. And, uh, but we, we still have a lot to do as far as bringing, um, you know, more black photographers, stylists, hair, makeup, creative directors, producers, uh, people that are the decision makers. And I'm very happy to see that happening, especially with, with what's going on in our racial climate today. Thank you for that, for sharing that. You are gorgeous, my goodness. I'm doing, I'm doing the math, trust me, in my head, I'm like. <laughs> Eight second, 1968, I'll save you that, that, that I was born, I'm 52 years old, yes, oh, and I have six goodness. and a half year old twin boys, happily married, house, I'm a mother, a wife, and a goddess, thank you. <laughs> I told Marcella at the beginning of the conversation, I said, oh, I was so intimidated to get on here and talk to you guys <laughs> because look at you two. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you. But I'm curious about you, you know, early in your career, right? Because what I gathered from what I've studied and read about you, that you, you kind of knew who you were, you know, and you were not afraid to make certain decisions and choose representation and be in the right company to get you to where you were looking to go. And I just want to hear about that because I know you've gone, you know, through a few agencies and representation to be able to get to the point that you, you have achieved in your career. Absolutely. I, I came into the business already grown. And though I was still shaping and forming into the woman that I am still becoming, I had a strong sense of self. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, I had all kinds of doubts, worries, and concerns being a Black woman in the fashion industry, um, and I acquiesced quite a bit. Uh, it wasn't until I turned 40 that I started to say my actual age. I had been told to lie about my age for years and years and years, um, but 
I am a women's empowerment activist and advocate. I have a women's empowerment group called Tamiko's Goddess Gathering, and I speak to women about owning their entire self, warts and all. And so I came in with that. And yes, I did go through a few agencies because if the white girls can do it, why can't I do it? If they can be seen by this client, why can't I be seen by this client? They knew that, you know, I was known for having meetings. <laughs> I would call my agents in and we would sit down and have meetings and I would ask them, why am I not being seen for this? And why am I not being seen for that? And I feel like my tenacity and my strong self of, sense of self continues to pay off. But the way, the, when it really showed me was when I landed my contract with Maybelline. I was the first black woman signed to an exclusive contract with them. And that's because um, my agency stood up for me. I stood up for myself. The time was ripe for somebody that was brown skin to be seen in that light. Um, for those of you not familiar with the modeling industry, getting a cosmetic campaign is like winning the lottery, winning the Super Bowl, you know, having your dreams come true. Um, so I was very honored. And to this day, I still get messages on my DMs and on my website thanking me um, for being that face of representation back in the early 90s and letting women that look like me um, know that they too are beautiful inside and out. So yes, we continue to make strides. I'm continuing and very honored to be one of the trailblazers that is making a way for the younger models that are coming up behind me. Amazing. Well, I'll say that I was at the age of wearing makeup when you got that contract and all of us followed your journey and being brown skinned as well, I thought, huh, I could actually find makeup that matches my skin finally. Um, yes. And we all felt beautiful because we saw you um, as a representation. I think Robin, Marcella, she just said something I think so interesting and profound, and I'm gonna rewind this and, and, and get that quote, but she said something about models representing beauty and therefore representing who matters. So seeing someone like you let us know that we we matter. Seeing this book, Marcellus, that you've put together and all of the shades of, of, of brown and black that are in this book and these gorgeous women and the stories you've shared say to us and those even looking to learn more about us that Yes, we are beautiful and, and we also matter, you know, so I'm going to get that quote that Robin um, shared. Tamiko, tell us a little bit about some of your most memorable and it can be awful and it can be the most amazing experience that you have had um, as a model. Tell me about like some of your greatest challenges and then tell us, yes, you got that contract, but something that happened to you as a model that you just will never forget. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I've learned again, I use my words very purposefully. So um, while some may have seen what I experienced as bad or challenging, I see them as opportunities for growth that has led, that has led me to the empowered woman that I am today. Um, Marcellus definitely brought up one of the um, not so great moments when I was in Paris, uh, early mid 90s terrified, had never really been outside of the United States, but I'm going to do this. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So I went to Paris. I was with Ford, one of the agencies at the time, um, and I was online. You know, these, 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 um, these um, runway shows, the, the cattle call for girls, I mean, we would be literally, I, I could have breakfast, lunch, and dinner and still be online waiting to be seen, um, to, be, to be seen for the show. And I remember getting to the front of the line, my turn to go in, three hours, and literally a woman said, and I excuse my accent, but oh my goodness, darling, I'm so sorry, but we are not seeing black girls this season. Hello? <laughs> what? Told me that four hours. <laughs> I'm at the door so that I wouldn't stand here for three hours for this, excuse me, bullshit, because um, that was ridiculous. So that's one of the one of the, the, the low lights, if you will. But, you know, they're, they're going to set and, and, okay, case in point, that, that, that is a model knows, you have to bring your own makeup to set. You should pretty much come with your hair done. And, you know, when they say, uh, uh, what they say, uh, like your, your body tone underwear, 
good luck finding that back in the day because they didn't have, you know, brown bras and brown underwear. So I've learned to take better care of myself as a model, as a rep representative of my business, which is me. And, um, you know, another highlight, I got goodness, there's so many, it's just opened so many doors for me. I started out as a model, but I have been since become a singer, an actress, a writer. I've overcome infertility. I'm happily married. I'm representing uh, different brands now that are finally realizing that women that look like me, that are mothers, that have young children, that are, uh, that are more seasoned, are worth marketing to as well. So everything that I went through um, as a model and I continue to go through strengthen, strengthens me as a woman. Wonderful. What are your thoughts on the industry now? Oh, I'm sorry, Marcellus, go ahead, honey. <laughs> Tell them what Carl Lagerfeld used to call you as Chanel. Oh, you're so sweet. And it's still, I mean, I, yes, I, I still have an AOL account. Don't judge me. But um, I still, and I use Gmail, but the reason why I keep the AOL account is because uh, Carl Lagerfeld, um, when I had the esteem, uh, the pleasure of walking in his shows several times, but the first time that I went and I was fit and I, and I got to, uh, to meet with him, he dubbed me, um, and again, excuse my accent, le, le, le princesse du chocolat. So he called me the chocolate princess. Um, and it's a name that I still carry to this day that I was very honored. And you know, I didn't take it to mean anything but admiration for this beautiful brown skin that I am in. And um, I worked for, I, I walked his runways for several years and every time it was a blast. Every time I felt like you couldn't tell me anything because this is what it's about. We want to be seen, we want to be equals, we want to be represented and shown for the beautiful people that we are. Wonderful, wow. Thank but you. I, you had a question, so Marcellus wanted me to say that, but I, I wanted to hear your question as well. Thank you, Marcellus. <laughs> <laughs> For both of you, any advice that you will give, and we're going to get into some uh, Q&A for a few minutes, what advice would you give for people now uh, looking to be, or, or Black women, women of color looking to be in the fashion industry today? Uh, any advice that you would, you could offer? Shall I start, Marcellus? Yes, please. Ladies first. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, well, you know what I'm going to say. Know who you are, stand tall in your beauty, um, speak up for yourself, know the business, know the clients that you're going to be presented to, but most importantly, have a really strong foundation of who you are. Um, you know, save your money, all these great things that we aren't told when we're young or starting out in the business are the things that I'm working to as well because I'm going to be offering classes on getting into modeling and, and, and all those things as well for women like me um, that want to just, you know, get the insight on it. So yeah, just know who you are um, and you don't have to conform to look like somebody else. You know, you being you and, 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 and that coming across in photos or being the chameleon that you can be uh, is very bankable. And, um, and, trend, and authenticity is the most attractive. So be your most authentic self. Oh, beautiful advice. Thank you. We'll put that yeah. on the t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> Tamika, thank you so very much for joining us tonight. I'm going to uh, cut you loose, but please stay and listen. We're going to take a few questions for you, Marcellus. And uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get into uh, a few of the questions. Marcella, somebody sent in a question for you about becoming an author and how you went about getting a book agent. Should someone publish, self-publish, or go through a publisher? That's one of the questions that we received. Okay. So I couldn't self-publish this book and get it and get it out the way that it came out. Abrams Books is my publisher, and it was a godsend to be able to work with them. Um, mm -hmm. So no, I'm not 
down with self-publishing. If you're doing like an ebook or something, then by all means self-publish. But if you want to do something that's beautiful, that's going to be in Barnes and Noble and on and on Amazon and in bookstores, that's one of the things that's so amazing for me is that my book is in museum bookstores. It's at, you know, it's at the African American Museum in Washington. It's at all of the Smithsonian museums. It's 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 at the um, it's at the Museum of Art in Chicago. It's just, it, it astounds me. But it's also in every, like, it's in tons of bookstores that are in your neighborhood. And I love that too. So what I always say to people is you have to find a literary agent because publishers aren't really going to pay attention to you unless, they, unless you have a literary agent. And it is difficult. But I'll tell you something. I found my literary agent because I went on Facebook and I said to my friends, one day I got really frustrated with my hosting agent who was supposed to be helping me shop my book. Mm -hmm. And she had said to me during like, a, uh, like an argument, we were going back and forth and she was like, I, I showed that book to everybody and nobody was interested. And I hung up the phone. I was like, that's it. Before I, before I let this take me someplace else, because I believed in this idea so wholeheartedly. Yeah. And I went, to, I went to Facebook and I literally said, does anybody have no a literary agent? Mm -hmm. And it was those posts that wasn't me smiling or, or being fabulous. It was me asking a question. Yeah. So only three people liked it and one person responded. And he turned out to be one of my oldest friends. And he was like, my cousin is a literary agent. What's up? And I told him what was up. And he introduced me to his cousin. And his cousin liked me and the idea. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So it was lucky because I had had the book at a bunch of different publishers before. And they had passed on. Well, two different publishers. Sterling Lord Literistic passed on it. They had it for a while. And before that, it was at Tashin. And Tashin passed on it. So it, in both of those places, I didn't have a literary agent. Okay. So I think you need to find a literary agent. Okay. And you need to network the same way you would find a model agent. You need to cold call. You need to go online and do your research. You need to, um, you, you need to look for like panels where literary agents are meeting and meeting new talent. And you have to work it that way. You have to do everything you can to get in the door, but you need a literary agent. Thank you. Ebony, thank you for your question. It took eight years. Eight years. I came up with the idea in 2011 because in 2011, a book came out called Vogue Model. The Faces of Fashion, or the Faces of the Faces of Fashion, and it was the British Vogue book. And I collect art books. There's stacks of art books all over this apartment: art, photography, designers, architecture, furniture. And I ordered that book as soon as it came out, and it was expensive. It's giant. It's bigger than my book. And I got that book the day it came. I read it from cover to cover. I got it at like eight o'clock at night, and I was up till like one. And then at the end, there were only two, I, I realized that there were only two black models in it. It was Iman and Naomi. And I was like, are you kidding me? There were all these mediocre white models and mediocre Latina models that, that hadn't had a cultural impact, hadn't had a quarter of the careers that Veronica Webb or, or Tyra Banks or Beverly Johnson had, or the girls from the Battle of Versailles like Billy Blair, Beth Ann Hardison, Pat Cleveland, the divine Clack, Pat Cleveland. You know what I mean? Or Peggy Dillard or Lana Ogilvie. You know, like run through the list, honey. And I was like, are you kidding me? So that night I did some research and there were a couple of books out about the topic, but there wasn't an art book. There wasn't an oversized tabletop, beautiful art book like the ones that I collect that really covered the subject in the same manner that white art books, white model books were. And like I ran through that list right then, I'm a model file. I know all these girls. I love them. I grew up with them. I covet their images. So I sat down with a yellow pad and I wrote out all these names. And by like five o'clock in the morning, I had like a hundred names. 
And I was like, I could write a book. There's enough black models, enough models of color that made an impact on this business that we could do a book, a standalone book. And that was how it happened. Eight years. That took some real perseverance um, to bring this to Along the way, I never, I would pick the book up and then I would put it down. And you know what? I treated the book like it was an also ran. So if I had a television show because I was a TV host, I would be focused on that and I would put the book down. If I was working busy as a stylist, I would put the book down. And in 2018, the end of 2017, the beginning of 2018, I feel like God was like, I'm going to take everything away from you that's standing in your way of this gift that I have given you, this gift that is this book. And so I couldn't get a job hosting shows. I went from being highly sought after to nobody would see me. I actually tried to audition for the reboot of Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, and they actually didn't want to see me because they said I was too old. And that's why I was arguing with my agent that day, my hosting agent, because I was like, why am I not doing E? Why am I not doing all the stuff that I was doing? And then I stopped working as a stylist because I had been pulling down like six, almost six figures a year as a stylist. And then all of a sudden it was like, nobody would hire me as a stylist. God literally was like, I am taking all the definitions that you have put on yourself that you have decided you are. I'm taking all, all that stuff away from you. And I'm leaving you with the idea I gave you. Now do something with it. And it was only when all that other stuff fell away, all that other stuff that I thought was important, being on television, you know, and making my money as a stylist. And I was broke, you know, it was only then that I turned my focus to the book. And it was like, this is all I have. I have to do this book justice and I have to get this done. And that's when the door started opening finally and things started clicking and they fell into place. Robin said something during when we were talking to her about that book being given to her and not wanting to write a book and not thinking about a book. I was too like that. I was like, ah, oh, you know, a book, a schmuck, you know, <laughs> it happens, it happens. But it was only when God stepped in and was like, uh uh, boo. This is you. This is your gift. You know, it's funny that you have been interviewing Andre Leon Talley because I was sitting in the seat of not thinking I was good enough for years to write the book. Because I was like, a, you know, I had some success as a TV host, but I wasn't like a stylist that was doing Vogue or doing like the big, you know, or doing celebrities because I decided that I wanted to be a commercial stylist and I wanted to go do like catalogs. So I was working for Kohl's and Bonton and Meyer and Target and I was making money, but it wasn't glamorous, you know, but it was pain. And I would think when I would, there'd be times with the book where I was like, well, I'm not Andre Leon Talley. Why doesn't he write this book? Or I'm not Edward Enninfo. Why doesn't he write this book? And I really felt like I wasn't good enough. And it wasn't until I found my literary agent and she was like so, um, she just believed in me and the project so much. And she was like, they didn't think of it, you did, write the book, it's yours. And that's a lesson that I had to learn. I'm 50 years old and I still was struggling with believing in myself because in my head it was still like, you're this little black gay guy from nowhere. Who do you think you are that you can write a book about fashion, you know? Who do you think you are that you can write a book? Because for so long I've been told, of my, you know, Black people always are told what they can't do. There are always limitations put on us, you know? And we have to believe in ourselves so much more than everybody else. And once you open that door to belief, that's when the blessings come. I didn't want to interrupt you because it's so profound and real what you just shared. And I see the comment section, people have a lot to say. And thank you for sharing that so honestly, because I think it resonates with the times that we are in right now um, with COVID and being shut indoors. You know, many people have lost their jobs or those projects that they were, you know, planning to work on this year, quite frankly, a lot has been stopped. So it's so interesting that you say, 
at a time when everything was stripped away from you, you got the clarity to focus on that project that you've been sitting on and look how many doors have opened, you know, since you were able to really focus on that. So I hope you guys heard that in your spirit the way that I heard it. I was very quiet because I was like, whoa, uh, I need to hear that because there's a, there's a blessing in those periods of time when everything is indeed stripped from you. If you can find that silver lining, it's very, very important. Um, I really want to sit here for another hour and talk to you because there's so many other things that I want to touch on. Guys, I know you have more questions. I received them. What I want to encourage us to do is find Marcellus and myself on social media. I want to keep this discussion going. I'm going to post your questions, the rest of the questions there. And Marcellus, I know you're very diligent. If you could answer them just add your handle to it add your question to it i promise that we will answer them and if there it takes longer we're going to have to get back on here for a part two because there's so many other things that i want to ask you about there's so many other models that i want to talk to um but i'm really grateful for this time for your story for you having the courage to persevere eight years um to bring this out because that representation is indeed priceless I want to see a model book about the male models. So I'll be looking for your next project, sir. <laughs> That's, um, I'm very close to selling my second book. Um, <laughs> right, so I'm very, I'm thrilled about that. That book is going to be beautiful. That book is, that idea, I mean, if I can pull that one off, that's going to be amazing. And then- you will four in me I like I'm not done I you know I just feel like I'm I, I can't believe I'm where I am right now and found the success and the love from other people and the public that I've been craving in so many ways because this book means so much to so many people you know it just and I'm just so happy that I was a small part of it you know what I mean because it's not about me it's about the icon inside and it's also about the other models that didn't make the book you know they're still valid just because I only had 204 256 pages to tell this story doesn't mean that you don't exist you know what I mean so it's amazing thank you so much to Miko thank you so very much Robin Givon for joining us and to all of you who came in here Marcellus quickly tell our friends here your uh social media handle so we can get those questions going okay so I have two it's Marky Mark like name and lights m-a-r-q-u-e-e-m-a-r-c that's my that's mine and then the book has its own and the book is Supreme Models book at Supreme Models book and I and I I'm always on both of them. I mean, so don't okay. send me DMs on Supreme Models book, boys, because other people are in that one. Boys keep creeping into my like Instagrams, which I love. And then like like, like my assistant will be like, "Who is so and so?" <laughs> Please, boys, if you would like to slide into his DMs, do it on March <laughs> on his personal Instagram and Twitter. Please. <laughs> Um, but yes, we will get your questions posted and get them answered. And sir, thank you so very much. And promise me when that second book does come that you'll come back and talk to us. I will definitely, I will definitely, definitely come back. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Absolute pleasure. So people, like he said, this book, widely available. Go to your independent bookstores in your cities. You can go to boutiques. I know it's in several boutiques because I've seen them. And if all else fails, get Amazon, but do support the book. Um, and there's a lot to be discovered here, to be honest. I, I, my mother even was reading it today, and, and we all had a discussion about it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have a wonderful evening, and we'll keep this party going on social media. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Bye, -bye.